I'm the course leader for MA Graphic Branding and Identity. My email address is just down at the bottom just here. Um, so my email address is there, it's p.jacksonlcc.arts.ac.uk. Um, if you have any questions that you don't want to ask in the session or you remember something later on, just email me. Um, anytime, anything, uh, I'm very happy to, to respond, providing I know the answer. Um, but that's me, that's Paul. I work here at UAL uh, at London College of Communication. As I said, this is MA Graphic Branding and Identity. If you're in the wrong place, please feel free to leave or stick around, your choice. Um, but I'm gonna give you a kind of an overview of what we do as a university, what we do as a college. Some of you might have been to Open Days before with UAL, so you might be familiar with some of the material that I put in front of you. But I really wanted to just give you a sense of what this MA is all about. Um, what I always like to start with is the kind of question uh, that you're probably asking yourselves at this point, which is, should you do an MA? Um, and what I often like to say is, should you do this MA? MA study is complicated, difficult, it's incredibly expensive. Um, and I think these are all really big reasons that you might be having thoughts about if this is the right next step for you. And actually, I kind of think about this open day as being an opportunity to voice those thoughts, those questions, those concerns from my point of view, um, and to listen to you kind of ask me questions about it too. So the fees for next year, if you're an international student, um, are this, they're £25,970. If you're a home student, if you're from um, the UK, your fees for the MA would be £9,250. Now, these are obviously sums of money that you're familiar with. You'll have seen these up on the website. You'll have seen them on our homepage. If you've been to the MA Graphic Branding and Identity homepage, and they are phenomenal amounts of money. And these are just the fees. This is before you even take into account how much rent you might have to pay, food, bills, any kind of travel costs. And that's as much commuting around London as it is going on um, exotic adventures. Um, you might find that you are enamored of vintage clothing and really nice places to eat. You might find that your computers break, you need to buy more hardware. And on top of all of this stuff, you're not making any money um, or you're not making as much money as you may have been making before you came to do the MA. You're taking time out of your career, you're taking time out of your life and you're throwing yourself into a completely uncertain environment. And that's costing you money so it's a big decision and i'm sure you're kind of coming to terms with this big decision all the time and trying to work out whether this is the right step for you so that's what i wanted to kind of come out with be upfront with because i think it's a really important thing that i acknowledge it too so here's this here's the big sell um this is university of the arts london this is um the number two arts institution uh, on planet Earth, according to one of the most recent metrics. Um, UAL is composed of six colleges across the city of London. We have LCF, London College of Fashion. We have Chelsea, we have Camberwell, Wimbledon, we have Central St. Martins, and of course, ourselves, London College of Communication. We're massive. We have 18,000 students from 130 countries, and we have a very strategic approach to what arts education should be doing in 2023 and beyond, and that is to offer a transformative arts and design education. We are world leading research and enterprise um, based college. We take research incredibly seriously. We're really interested in this idea of knowledge exchange and partnerships with, um, with external agents and forces. Um, and we are focused on this idea of being an inspirational place to be. So as a university, we are a huge successful environment. We're doing lots of interesting things across lots and lots of different um, places. Um, and this is LCC, uh, London College of Communication. LCC is um, what we used to call a trade school. LCC was started about 150 years ago, 120 years ago, at St Bride's um, Print Institution, College, Church, I'm not quite sure what it was. Um, and we were born out of this old print place. 
and we became the London College of uh, Distributive Trade, Print and Dis Distributive Trade. And we very much had this vocational sense of what education should be doing. The point of it was that it was helping you become better printmakers, better facilitators of print. And that's why we were called London College of Printing for such a long time, for about 50 years. We changed our name to London College of Communication about 15 years ago. And we are, yeah, that's what we are now. We are a communication college. And just to disclose my absolute bias, I am a student as well as a member of staff at LCC. I'm currently uh, studying my PhD here. And as a result of that, I have to tell you completely, completely subjectively, that I think London College of Communication is a fantastic place to be. And I'm not just saying that because I get paid by them. I am saying that as a student, and I'm saying that as somebody who adores being in art school. I think art education is one of the one of the best things that a person can do, really. Sorry, my phone is uh, just ringing. Um, I think art education is a kind of a wonderful experience. I think it's a valid way to spend your life, your career, doing lots of interesting things. One of the things that lots of people are attracted to with LCC are our workshops. And they are possibly one of the biggest features of the institution. When you come into LCC, if you've never visited before, we have a workshop block, which is where MA Graphic Branding and Identity Studios are. But as well as that, in that space, you will find all of these incredible um, facilities. We are next door to Letterpress. We are below the screen printing studios. We're just down the road from the digital printing area. We're upstairs from the 3D workshop. And that just means that our students are completely connected to all of these really wonderful technical areas. But we're not just a college, we're not just a university, we are a course. And this is us, this is MA Graphic Branding and Identity. I'm assuming that you're here for the open day because you have an interest in what this course does. And because of that, you might well have read some of the material that is on the website. And the thing that you will find when you read into the course and what the course is all about is that it says things like this, that the MA Graphic Branding and Identity explores the gap between academic research practice and commercial design. And I think as an overall point of view, that's quite an accurate way of representing what the course is about. We say things like this, we have our, our sets of aims um, that you can read at any time you want to. We call ourselves a course for designers and we say that the main goal of the course is to examine contemporary and historical brand strategy and to define the, uh, the designer's role in creative practice. Going further down, you can find out that we equip you with a wider understanding of creating brand solutions for diverse markets and cultures. We equip you with knowledge, abilities and methods. We explore how your practice will explore, interrogate, even challenge the existing forms of the discipline through independent and collaborative inquiry. Okay, they're what we say. They're the things that are up front on the website. And I think they are a perfectly good description of what the course is all about. However, I think what's really important to do is to talk about what's not written in smart academic language on the main page of the website, because the course is doing its own thing. It has its own sets of goals, but we're well aware that the people that are coming into the course have their own aims and objectives too. One of the things that we have to really talk about here is what the point of a master's course is. Why are you interested in doing this? And what is it going to do for you? Now, this is a big question. It's a question that we ask you in the application process. It's a question that we ask you when you're on the course. It's a question that we ask you as you leave the course, is how are you using this? Now, for the most part, the majority of our students are employment focused. This is often a step in a career path. And that can mean lots and lots of different things. Lots of people do it for different reasons. But ultimately, we're interested in what kind of work you as a participant, as a potential student, want to do beyond the MA. We ask you a lot of questions about this. This is one of my favorite anecdotes. Uh, forgive me if you've heard this before. 
we're always asking students about what makes them distinctive as a designer, as a practitioner, as a potential employee, as a researcher. And I always like to talk about this person here. This is uh, a person who was a big cattle owner in the 19, uh, sorry, in the 1840s in the United States of America. And at that point, all of these big cattle owners would brand their cattle. They would have these hot metal logotypes and they would stamp them into the sides of their cows. And they all did it, except for this guy. This guy was the only person who didn't do it. This guy's name was Samuel Maverick. What I love about this is that this is where we get the idea of a maverick from, as somebody who isn't doing what everyone else is doing. And for us, this is the key driver, the key reason we talk about compelling distinctive narratives in graphic branding and identity. It's all about difference. It's all about establishing what makes you different than from what everyone else is doing around you. And that really drives us as a course. This is what we're completely focused on. This question, how do you stand out when everything around you looks the same? And I'm not just talking about products. I'm not just talking about merchandise. I'm not just talking about social media. I'm talking about design language. I'm talking about the kinds of things that we see in CVs, the kinds of things that we see in portfolios. We are living in a time where master's level education is questionable as a mode of learning and thinking and doing and we've got to say to ourselves why is masters-ness desirable why would you want to be a master of something like graphic branding and identity we think it's all about this idea of standing out now when you read into the literature around design around branding you start to penetrate and start to understand that lots of brands out there and lots of academics out there are talking about this idea of differentiation. This quote is a perfect example of this. As one of a company's most valuable intangible assets, a brand functions as a powerful differentiator for the business and as a decision-making tool for customers. Now, lots of brand literature is written from this point of view. It's inherently strategic. It's inherently market-driven. It's basically economics. And what we're always interested in is what's our role in this as people who make beautiful objects, beautiful design resolutions, people who work in two and three dimensions, people who translate complex ideas into visual communication. Now, what you come up against a lot when you get into the research area that is branding are these kinds of ideas. They talk about brand as intangible, as something that can be thought of in an abstract way, but becomes very difficult to present to people. And that's our job. Our job is to take the things that are intangible, difficult to describe, abstract ideas, and to make them into these things that do flip people's ways of thinking. Ultimately, that is what we're talking about on the course. Excuse me. So when we talk about the aims of the course, all of that stuff that I said earlier on is valid, but I think it's as simple as this. The purpose of this master's is to develop usable insights. Now, this word insight is incredibly popular at the moment. Any of you who have got design background, it will be, it will be coming up in your professional lives, it will be coming up in your research, it will be coming up in your uh, previous education, when you go to other seminars, other conferences, people talk about insight like it's the holy grail, like it is the thing that everybody has to have. And to a great extent, they're right. But it is an incredibly difficult thing to discover. It is difficult to understand when you found one. There's a really wonderful piece of literature that we use on the course, which compares insights to the refrigerator. And the only way that you know that you found an insight is when the light goes on, when you open up the door. And I think that's a tremendous way of describing insight. Insight's all about this idea, this feeling that you have, that everything is clicking into place, that your way of communicating resonates with those people that you're trying to target. Now, 
what we always say on the course is that insights are so important because they drive the research that we do and they come out of the research that we do. They affect the way that we design, they affect the methods of design that we use. And of course, on a, on a kind of much bigger level, insights are what give brands their distinctiveness, their compelling stories, their points of difference. Now, when I put those three things together, this idea of being a researcher, a designer, and, a, and, a, and a, a commercial worker, I'm talking about this idea of employability. Our aim as a course is to help you diversify your approaches to this subject area, to encourage you to become a specialist in this subject area. Now the subject area is massive. Branding is massive. Lots of people are talking about it. Lots of people are exciting about, excited about it. And it is this big amorphous object which seeps into so many different trades, so many different vocations, so many different ways of thinking and doing. It gets into marketing, economic, psychology. It can be looked at in relation to lots and lots of different disciplines, not simply design, not simply the arts, but across huge sectors. Now, you as a designer are going into this and it isn't any one thing. So the point of the masters for us is to think about how you position yourself on the other side of this. What do you want to do? Where do you want to be employed? Some of our students come in as designers, as graphic designers, as visual makers. They come out of here wanting to go into different directions. They might want to become producers, planners, strategists. They might want to shift their approach to design. They might want to work in a different media. They want to, might want to work across multimedia. We think that the main goal of a lot of our students is to become an art director or a creative director. That's often the career path that our students are on. They're intending to go in as middleweights beyond the course and to work their way up to positions of management and seniority. But it changes from person to person. We like to keep the masters flexible so that it gives people this opportunity to try lots and lots of different things. And we try to keep that openness in the way that we run the course. Our alumni are successful. We have a tremendous um, history of our students progressing into lots and lots of different places in a very kind of brand agency oriented way of describing where people have gone. We find that our students tend to look at big agencies and we've got people who in the last couple of years are working across Super Union, Interbrand, we have students in Habas, um, Mintel, Saatchi and Saatchi. We've had past graduates going to other big institutions, working in-house at places like the BBC. Some people have worked at WPP. We've had students go on to become um, ad buyers, working in production, working in other kind of um, media organisations. We've got people who've gone into freelance work, people who've gone into um, kind of more international strategy, consultancy. Our students go everywhere. We keep in touch with lots of our graduates. We have a thriving um, alumni network. We're building it all the time and we get them to come back in and work with our current students. I think it's really important that our graduates continue to have this connection with the MA and it's really important that they're coming back and passing on the knowledge that they're getting now that they're out in the world. So the people that are here today, um, you might be thinking to yourself, am I the right kind of person to be studying MA Graphic Branding and Identity? And the typical um, applicant for the course tends to come from university um, within a couple of years. So lots of our current students are people who are either recent graduates, they finished a broad visual com uh, communication course in the last year or two. Some of our students are at a kind of early or mid-career point, so they might have worked as a junior for a couple of years, they might be just about to progress into mid-career, they might have an itch that they want to scratch, they might want to come back into study um, to just resolve a few things. We do get people who come in because they want to start something up or work in a kind of a bigger enterprise and they want to focus some time and energy on brand 
strategy, brand design, so that they're in a position to to kind of um, uh, to launch something, which is an interesting direction for, for people coming into the course. Some of our students are coming in because they are moving, they're shifting from working in design to working in design um, academia. So they might be people who want to teach or to step up to doing something like a PhD. But I think what sort of unifies all of the people that apply on uh, into the course is that they are curious. Um, they're at a point where they're interested in doing something different, something interesting, something that maybe is pushing at the boundaries of what the subject currently does. We like to say this, whoever's coming into the course is about to become a researcher. This is a research course, and this is incredibly important. It's not business school. It's not strategy school. It's not making you into somebody who is just going to do lots of design briefs um, in the way that you maybe have done in commerce or in your degree. We are a research course. All MAs are. And we really like to take away uh, this description from Zimmerman of the research process. It is a process of iteratively designing artifacts as a creative way of investigating what a potential future might be. Really nice romantic way of describing research. I have millions of romantic ways of designing, re des uh, of describing research. A lot of people make this kind of, I think slight error when they're thinking about research as being something which is about finding information. I think that's vital. I think it's a part of any research process. On the course, we don't see research as a simple discovery process. We see research as something which is investigative and it is about the future. So it's very much about this idea of testing, of making, of doing things, speculative ideas, putting them into the world and seeing what the response to that is across all kinds of stakeholders. So that's the kind of research that we are interested in as a course, it's research that puts practice at its center. Any research that involves practice as a way of doing, as a way of learning things, is often called a practice-based research course. And that's what we think of ourselves as. Practice-based design research uses design projects as a research strategy to enable exploratory investigations of indeterminate fuzzy research problems or multivariate messy situations where specific research questions emerge only as the practical work develops. Oof, that is a big, that is a big one. Um, and just to unpack this a little bit, we are really interested in the stuff that people don't know how to fix. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, that sounds great, but that's quite romantic. That's quite a sort of, academic approach to problem solving, what does that have to do with contemporary approaches to brand graphic design? What we would always say in this instance is that branding is always about the next big thing. Branding is always about predicting the future. It is about trying to understand what's happening in the current day-to-day -day framework and where people are likely to go next. Now, arguably, branding is often focused on marketing. It's often focused on selling, making things happen, making things sellable. And that's true. And it's very, very difficult to work in contemporary practice without selling stuff for money. It's a big part of what drives um, contemporary branding. However, the, the hand that feeds you as a creative is a hand that is becoming more and more open and susceptible to pressures from without. They are more concerned with sustainability. Even the ones that are greenwashing are slowly shifting their practices to be more responsible, um, more friendly to the environment and more conscientious in terms of what they make. They're becoming more aware of sort of social racial justice in what they're doing. They're becoming more message oriented. And some of the more kind of um, progressive brands out there are starting to genuinely look at their offer and think about how they communicate new narratives to ever discerning audiences. Now we think they are the very definition of indeterminate or fuzzy problems, messy situations where things are constantly in flux. 
we're not a course which is simply about making logos we're not a course that's simply about making merchandise tote bags selling crap making more crap we are very much inter interested in this idea of what branding can do as an active practice when you come onto the course we really like to send our students out into the world we like students to take control of what it is that they want to do with the course and we often come back to this idea that's that the master student is a driver and not a passenger it's probably going to be very very different as a way of thinking about the world uh, uh, thinking about your education thinking about your practice and it's going to be unlike anything that you've probably ever done that's probably the reason why you're interested in opening yourself up to a possibility like this that you're not going to have a simple linear journey on this if you've worked commercially you know what i'm talking about jobs are often quite linear they might have a couple of points in them where you are potentially reiterating revisiting things but ultimately it's an it's a straightforward creative process what we're interested in is playing with ways of doing this of being designers of being creative practitioners that are not simply following linear paths we want you as students to really take advantage of that to think about projects as being open of, of being things that you can drive you can move forward and we like to integrate lots of methods of action into that we think of ourselves as a practice-based course and we think of ourselves as action researchers action research is quite traditional um, terminology now you might be familiar with it action research is very much this idea that all processes in research are cycles they're very much about you going out into the world and making things happen um, and we like to think of brands as, as, as something similar to that that they are not these static objects that they are constantly in flux they are constantly moving they are dynamic they have to be resilient and agile in order to work in contemporary society and because of that we like that to be the way that our students practice so we send students out we send them into the world we send them to go out and do deep research we send them out with their prototypes to go and test things in the field to put things in front of people and to look at what actually happens when the things that you're designing and communicating interact with the people for whom these things have been designed we like that to be an ongoing cycle until the process until, until the thing that you're making the product the brand the intervention is at its most optimum and in a place where you can deliver it and put it into the field and we like to think of that as our kind of backbone of doing research i'm going to another quote here this is uh, a design writer and thinker called George Vascara, a real popular reference for people who are based in user design and service design. User design and service design, again, are things that influence us in a really big way as a course. Um, but Frascara says this, the design of the research method and the design of the design method are tasks of a higher order than the design of the actual communications. Why am I saying this? Well, the reason I'm saying this is because lots of the time people just jump to the end of things now what that often means is that you imitate you reconstitute you basically spew back into the world a slightly different version of what's already there and that's what happens a lot of the time in communication design if somebody gives you a brief you look at similar briefs you look at similar outputs you look you given work by a client you look at who else has worked for the client what kind of work was produced for that client and oftentimes what you're doing is you're building your projects on weak foundations you're building your responses on weak foundations you're not necessarily thinking about what you need to learn or what you need to find out in order to make it more unique more distinctive more compelling you're looking at the end result there's nothing wrong with that it's how commerce works it's how we're taught in other arenas in undergraduate practice is basically to look at what's happening to do our version of it and to form our authorship around that however that's not what we want to see in this course we're really interested in attacking pro problems and projects 
from a much deeper place, a richer place. That often means going back to the very, very beginning and starting our research processes creatively, working with different forms of literature, different forms of audiences, and starting to actually say, what's really happening here? Now, that's something that you find in user design, it's something you find in service design, and it's something which is often used to uncover, again, this word, insights. What you're doing there is you're designing ways of finding things out before you're designing ways of designing. And then you start to think, what am I actually communicating to my end user? The communication design is right at the end of that process. So research for us is ongoing. It's continual. It runs all the way through the process. We're a collaborative course. Right now, our students are doing lots and lots of different forms of collaboration. Um, we bring in live clients. So if any of you have been on the website, you'll see that there's a few, um, a few projects on there that have been done in recent years. A lot of our collaborative work was disrupted quite a lot through the pandemic. However, we did get to do some really wonderful work in the pandemic with Heinz. Uh, Kraft Heinz came in, wanted to work with us on some plant-based condiments. This, for me, is one of those perfect examples of big brand, of big corporations looking at shifts in the marketplace. This was happening in 2020, 2021, and it's a point where plant-based foods were suddenly making huge waves in the, um, in the food markets. And Heinz were aware of this, and they were obviously thinking of themselves as a condiment maker, and we're thinking, what can we offer as a brand here, what's our point of difference going to be? How can Heinz kind of enter into what was already at that point uh, a really popular marketplace? So this is very much about Heinz designing a range of sources, which they'd already planned, and giving our students the opportunity to develop lots of different, lots of different creative routes to think about how Heinz might fit into that marketplace. It was a really wonderful project. And it, what was great about it was that Heinz came to us with one of their experimental team labs, and that that just meant that they were interested in some fairly oblique strategies, which is what I think we tend to pride ourselves as, at as an institution. We're an award-winning course. We've done lots of really interesting work over the years with different clients, but we also like to get our students to enter competitions. Last year, we really pushed the DNAD competition awards. Um, we had a couple of students get shortlisted, so we ended up taking away a couple of pencils, which is the award that you get for a DNAD um, student prize. And this year, we've decided to build on that success. So we're widening our offer a little bit in terms of the competitions. We've got lots of student teams working across four of the big design organizations in the UK, DNAD, um, the RSA. We're working with the Creative Conscience Project and we're also looking at the International Society of Typographical Design competition prizes too. Any of you who are in this open day who maybe have entered or are entering these competitions at the moment will be well aware that what these projects really offer you is an opportunity to do some um, intriguing research into oftentimes people like you. Um, what we often think of when we look at the DNAD briefs is that they're not so much design competitions as they are research competitions. They're often looking for students to understand audiences in insightful ways and open up paths and strategies to talking to audiences that haven't really been thought of before. And we, we like to treat the, the DNAD prizes certainly like that, that they're an opportunity for you to put into practice rich, deep, methodological approaches to research and to see if you can actually use those in more commercial environments. So we're really big fans of those briefs because they're commercial briefs and they give us an opportunity to do interesting work. Who we are, who is us, who is the team? There are four main tutors on the MA. Um, so that's me, Paul. Um, I work with three other full-time lecturers. So we have um, Emily, we have Rob and we have Pearl, all of whom are designers, strategists, consultants. They've worked across print, media, culture, commerce. They've worked for 
big brands, small startups in all kinds of different roles. So your core team are people who are experts in their field. They are all masters educated and are all at a point in their careers where they're thinking about further research, doing more kind of speculative work, continuing to have commercial practices, and of course, to teach. So they're the four people that you will spend most of your time with. However, we're a really dynamic course and we're constantly opening up the course to bring in lots and lots of different types of people. This is just an example. This was a, a unit that we ran last year, uh, a 10 week unit. And into that unit, we brought at least uh, a sort of another sort of 10 people into that. What we're trying to do all the time is open up the subject area. We're trying to show you and work with people from an immense range of disciplines. Most of the people on our course are graphic designers at heart. They often started in a graphic design capacity, but have gone on to work in all kinds of different ways for brands and with brands. And what we're really trying to do is give you that sense of the pathways that are available to you as young designers, where that can take you. Um, so on a, on, a, on a unit by unit basis, what we're doing is we're thinking about how many people we can put in front of you and what you can learn from them. To do that, we do a lot of workshops. I'll talk about those in a little while. But we scatter those across our five main projects that we do on the course. So we're, in some senses, quite simple um, in terms of our structure. This is pretty much how the, the MA breaks down into four terms. So on the left-hand side, you'll see that in the first term, there is a um, a brand and design principles unit, as well as a field of study report unit. Now, what we're trying to do in that first term is a kind of a 10 week foundation course um, in the subject area. And we do that in two very different ways. So in the principles unit, that's a very fast, intensive um, course in practice, in different forms of brand and design practice. What we do is we have weekly um, practitioners, lecturers, um, different people from different forms of brand and design. They come in, they talk about a key principle, and then they will workshop it with you. And that's often done in groups or it's done individually. It's often done in a single day. It might be kind of a two day thing. It's quite an intensive portfolio building unit. The other unit is a little bit more academic. It's about writing a report on how you see your field of study. Uh, and what we mean by your field of study is what it is that you're interested in exploring as a practitioner and how that intersects with this idea of what graphic branding and identity is um, for you. So it's very much about kind of contextualizing your work. After the Christmas break, the winter break, we go into another two units. So we start two new units. We start our collaborative unit, and we also start working on what will become your, your major project. So we start writing your major project proposal. In this term, this is where we do lots of things like live projects, external client work, competition briefs, and continue to do um, practitioner workshops with our, with our guest tutors. So we keep it a fairly intensive continuation of that, of that kind of constant um, immersion in what you can do as a designer in graphic branding and identity. But alongside that, you're developing a proposal and that proposal will become your final major project. So straight after the winter break, you're pretty much starting um, the final major project that you will do on the course. Now, it's not a one single thing and we're really open to the types of projects that students want to do on the course. Lots of our students are really socially engaged. They want to do projects which focus on quite complex issues, messy issues. And that means that their, their research process is quite complex. It requires quite a lot of different strategies, different ways of approaching different problems. So we like to start that process as soon as possible and have it continuing for um, for about 10 weeks before we write that up into a final proposal. Once that proposal's handed in and signed off, you're into your final major project. 
And that final major project occupies the last five months of the course. And that project can really take any shape or form that you want it to as a designer, as a practitioner, as a student. And what we're thinking about with the, with the final major project is how is this going to do all of the things I said earlier? How is it going to get you job interviews? How is it going to get you into people's heads, minds, faces? How is it going to show them ways of thinking about the subject area that they've maybe not started to consider yet? For us, that's the game. That is the absolute plan here, is to get you out of this course hungry, ready, and desirable. We want you to be people who people want to employ. I thought I'd just throw a slide in here, which is a kind of a sample week of the course, because oftentimes people ask me questions about um, what the week looks like on the course. These are the this is the week that we are currently running in the course. So these are, this is literally this week um, right now. Um, we generally try to focus on three taught days a week. So you will engage with us as a course directly on three days this year. We're doing Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Okay. Um, every Monday is a big day. Um, so Monday is a, a workshop day. It kicks off with a two hour lecture and briefing and then it runs out into our studios and it then um, becomes a collaborative workshop that runs until sort of five o'clock in the afternoon and we finish with a crit so it's a very self-contained active day's work tuesdays we generally keep clean um, for lots of different reasons the main reason is that lots of people have lots of work to do other students like to go to the workshop to do technical workshops um, in the different areas of LCC. Other people simply like to continue to have a job. So Tuesdays is a day where people sometimes work part time. We do workshops on Wednesday mornings in our studios. We have support with things like language development and academic support that generally runs every Wednesday afternoon. As well as that, there is an existing um, lecture series that's running in LCC called AI and Ethics, which is exactly what you would imagine it to be. That's currently running um, on Wednesday afternoons as well. So Wednesday becomes quite a full day as well. Thursdays at the moment, we offer two different kinds of tutorials to all of our students every week. So they can have group tutorials in the morning and they can have individual tutorials in the afternoon. Um, and what we try to do with a Thursday is what we call an open studio. So we just have the all of the tutors on site in real life doing lots of work with lots of um, lots of whoever wants to come in. Friday, we, again, put it away for self-directed study, and we let people decide on how they want to use that day for themselves. I just referred to this really quickly. Um, basically, how we're teaching at the moment is that we are, we're a studio class, we're a studio course. We very much like to do as, as much of our course as possible in real life. So we're focused around studio, workshop, lecture activity. We like students to be in using the specialist facilities. We want them to be in like using the learning zones, the libraries, and all of those kinds of places. We do sometimes prepare online learning before classes. So we might release sometimes a lecture uh, a few days before a workshop so people have time to kind of understand it. And we record all of our lectures that are happening in real life as well. But generally speaking, we don't do a serious amount of online learning um, on the course. We do offer a proportion of our tutorials online, mainly for convenience, um, but we see ourselves as a physical course. And that's it, really. Um, I can talk a little bit about the application process if anyone wants me to. Um, but I think what I might suggest is that we open up for some questions, um, if anybody has any questions. But I don't know how to do this. I... <laughs> yes, so I'm going to pop in now. Um, thank you very much for that really informative and wonderful presentation. Um, and just a reminder to anyone, if you've got any questions, there is a little question tab on your GoToWebinar control panel, please, please do pop those in there and we will go through them. Um, so I do have a couple in already, uh, Paul, so I'm going to read them out. And uh, yeah. yeah, some of them might be a little bit of overlap um, no, because great. you've covered everything so thoroughly. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so we'll start with the first one and it's, um, 
does the MA offer brand strategy courses? That's a good question. Um, what I would say is not really. So we, we're not a strategy course and we don't specifically teach a strategy course on top of that. There are courses around that do focus on strategy. There are, there are other MAs around. There's a really good one, I think, at Westminster. There's a good one at Goldsmith. But Goldsmith is a little bit more academic. It's a bit less strategic. I think there's a couple of others um, in London, but I'm not 100% of where they are. But I really want to emphasize we're a design course first. It's impossible to talk about design for branding without talking about brand strategy. And we do make it part of what we want our students to do. I would never say we teach a strategy course, okay? So I want to be just really upfront about that. Perfect, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this one's quite a long question, so um, thank you very much for filling this out, but I'll read out the whole thing just so that we get all of the information. Very enthusiastic. Yeah. Um, about branding and service design, I understand that a good brand is like a promise for a good service. To do good branding, I have to do in-depth research on the service, understand its operation, management, and people, etc. How do you think about the relation of these? Uh, which one is broader, or do they complement each other? That's a great question. I, these are the kinds of questions I love. So yeah, so this is a really complex question, and I think it, I think it often, it often comes up on the course because we talk about this idea. This, um, I think it's Walter Landor's idea. That, that products are made in the factories and brands are made in the mind. And I think services fit into that too. I think merchandise fits into that too. Now, it can be quite challenging to do a course like this without designing the thing first. And that's one of the things that we often find is that students can get quite obsessed with designing a service, with designing an app, with designing a place, with designing a product. Um, and the focus that they can give to that can overshadow the the thing that they're designing which is ultimately the promise now i think you've nailed it when you've said that that the promise is everything and for me you don't need to know that much about the service to be able to design a brand for it you need key information you need key ideas but ultimately you don't need to design that in our course space um, and I think that that's one of the things that we're often trying to do is to sort of get people away from being specifically a service designer and actually start to think to themselves how do I present this how do I create belief around this um, but that's one of the things that we tackle in our um, in our in our collaborative unit because the collaborative unit becomes this really wonderful opportunity to actually go and work with some service designers or to go and work with some people who are doing UX UI um, who've got this fantastic idea, this fantastic product. They can talk about it like it's a religion, but they can't communicate it for toffee. And that's where we come in. Our job is putting things onto a beautiful plate, is getting people excited, hyped up about something. And we're always, we literally write lists down on our, on our whiteboards in the class, which says, not your job, your job. And we're always trying to move things across to the column which is what's the contemporary graphic brand designer responsible for here so it's in flux uh, and i think it's a fantastic question and and the ma will never will never tell you that there's one way or another way to do it we'll always be kind of open to that because some brand designers are service designers at the same time it's very hard to delineate between where one role ends and where the next one begins but it'll be question Fantastic, thank you. Um, so more questions coming in now, which is always nice to see. Um, when it comes to the portfolio, what language yes. or slash format or manner do you expect the applicants to express it in? I mean, it depends. It depends on what you're showing us. So we like annotated portfolios, and what I mean by that is a little bit like I've just shown on the slide here um, that there is a bit of annotation in English to just explain what's happening in the in the process images that are below. Um, so if your portfolio was designed, if, sorry, if the work that's in your portfolio was designed for an audience that speaks in a non-English language, we don't expect it to be translated. 
but we would like to see some annotation about what's actually happening um, if it's necessary. So if there is language happening in the design work or in any part of the process and you feel like it's necessary to communicate what it's actually saying, then a translation doesn't hurt, but that can just be done very simply through a bit of annotation. But what we like to think about in, in, in portfolio design is good design can transcend verbal language. And where I've split this up into two parts, we've got this kind of process part and we've got a product part. Now, product is often about finish. It's often about finesse. It's often about showing that you have the capacity to put something together in a harmonious, um, balanced, beautiful way. And we love to see shots like that. We love to see what we might call hero shots. I apologize for the gendered language, but we like to see the star of a, pro of a, of a project. But we're really interested in process. As I say, we're a research, a research course, annotated documentation of experiments, of any kind of primary research that you've done, data visualizations, sketchbooks, they're really welcome. Now, I'm not saying you should fill your portfolio with tons and tons and tons of process, especially if it's repetitive. But it might be the case that you want to show one or two different types of process alongside outcomes. When we see that, we start to see what kind of a thinker you are. If we just see product, we don't know anything about what you've done, how you've got there. If we see process, we start to understand how all of this stuff works together. But we have interviewed people from everywhere. And I have interviewed people whose work has never been designed for an English audience. So we're not judging um, based on whether we can or can't read it in our own language. Lovely, thank you very much. Is there a place to see examples of portfolios? Um, no, unfortunately there's not. And I think the reason for that is because I can't officially uh, share portfolios um, with anybody else. So I can't, I can't unfortunately present portfolios as part of my, um, as part of my presentation. No problem at all. Thank you very much. Another portfolio question. On the website, it says that there should be a maximum of 19 images. If mm. I'd like to share my process, let's say from step one to five, would mm. that count as five images or can I think of them as one big image? I think think about them as one big image because I think that on, on this slide that I've just put up here, that, that there's, um, I think, eight, uh, sorry, seven images uh, at the bottom in a kind of a cluster. Um, so I think that that would count as a single image. It would be a flattened JPEG. And I think what a lot of our students do is, what our applicants do is they present each one of those pages as a kind of montage. So they're using quite creative approaches to what an image is by including um, sort of different bits of process in, inside each one of those 19 JPEGs. So yeah, so I think you can be quite creative in how you how much information makes it into a single image. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, what is the average number of students per class? Great question. Uh, I actually meant to tell you this, I wasn't hiding this information. Um, so we, we try to have a number of, uh, of around 50 students on the course. So this year we have 53 students on the course. Um, Previous years, it's it's generally between it's between 55 and 60 maximum. Um, the COVID year, we did have a big year group, so I think last year's was was the biggest we've ever had. There were 75 students in the course, but generally speaking, it's around 50. Lovely, fantastic, and uh, back to the portfolio. <laughs> Um, should the portfolio only contain branding and identity content, or can there be other designs too? I mean, I think other designs too. What what we we do like to see branding content, of course, but I think what actually tells us a lot about how you work are other kinds of projects. So we generally see lots of installations, we see illustration projects, we see book projects, we see editorial, um, we see photography projects. I think what you're trying to do with your portfolio is it's just show us how you approach things differently. Um, because we like to think of we like to think of you as art directors, and that means that showing us a multidisciplinary approach actually tells us something about what how you handle uh, different ways of 
different ways of expressing ideas, different ways of communicating to audiences. But we do, we do, we we should emphasise that we do like to see brands in there because obviously that tells us something about how you perceive branding as a subject as well. But yeah, mix it up. Excellent advice. Um, fantastic. And just a few more. Um, how yeah. much collaborate with other students on the course? Um, quite a lot, actually. So this this current this current project that we're running at the moment, um, we encourage our students to to actually reach out and collaborate around the around the university and around the college. Um, one of the things that happens quite a lot is that students meet lots of other students through the shared research program. They get to go to different seminars with the stu with students from other courses. Plus, they also live oftentimes with people from other courses too. Um, and what that's meant this term is that we've really found that our students have been working with lots and lots of different courses um, without us organising it. We, we generally don't organise cross course stuff as a single course. Um, but this year it's been really wonderful to see that. So yeah, we've seen some really interesting user experience, interaction design crossovers this year. Going back to the service design question earlier on, we've seen a few service designers come sniffing around the branding studios looking for some um, some help with with their kind of creative conscience projects as well because they often do the these kind of really beautiful services but they make them look awful and if there's one thing that brand and design students can do it is make a really really beautiful uh, diagram so so that's been yeah that's something that we really encourage on the course <laughs> fantastic um and the last question, and then we will be perfectly within the hour, which is fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone, for your questions. If you do have any more, pop them in now, because we do have a little bit of time. But for now, the last one, unless any others pop up, would you like to see commercial projects that are non-experimental in the portfolio? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, I think that's really important. Um, so I think if you've been working commercially, I totally appreciate what you're saying, but you know, when you do a commercial job, you don't often get that much time to um, to experiment. But what we sometimes, what I might sometimes say is, you probably will have also in any commercial job some process, um, and that might just be notes. It might just be a couple of really quick drawings. It might be a couple of mock-ups that you did that didn't get accepted. And actually, I think they're really, I think they're really important too. So. It's great for us to see commercial projects because we see how you finish um, and finishes everything, finishes what the, what the consumer sees. Um, but think about what you might also have that could, that could help support anything commercial too. I think everything is experimental. It's just a question of what we mean by an experiment. I really do. Um, fantastic. Absolute last one then this time. <laughs> um, <laughs> One more popping up, which is a good question. What are the major factors required to get admission onto the course? Is it the interview, transcripts, or grades? What's considered most highly? Um, personally, I don't care about grades. Um, there, there is a there is a requirement that you have passed your um, your undergraduate course, so that you do need to have a certificate for that. You do need to have an IELTS score of six point five. Um, so they are they are obviously requirements to, to be able to hit the level. Um, for me, it's everything is, is, is about your portfolio and about your, about your interview. It's about, it's about the way that you express your interest in doing this and why you want to do this specifically, why this is the right course for you and why it's gonna be useful for you. Um, we know that you know, an MA is a really good thing to have. We know that a certificate from UAL is a really good thing to have, but that's not worth twenty-five thousand pounds. I'm just not I'm not in I'm not I just don't entertain that. What what you've got to do is to sort of you've got to talk about this like it's an investment. You know, this is this is you putting time and money in yourself. And we want to make sure that you, you know, you're doing right by yourself. Um and I'll often say this that when we're interviewing I'm not checking to see if you're right for the course. I'm. I want you to check that I'm right for you as a course. So I think it's a real two-way street when you get to the interview because it's it's really just it's about 
being passionate. It's about being curious. It's about really wanting to do this. Um, and that's not just that's not always about beautiful work in a portfolio. It's not always about academic references in a study proposal. It's just about you being genuine, and being honest, and being open about about what you're doing and why this is right for you. And I often think it's the first tutorial of the course. It's where you start to lay out what your agenda is. So for me, that's that's the most important thing. It's it's a great portfolio. It's a really strong interview. That's what I'm really looking for. Um, the study proposal is important because it helps us understand a little bit about how you you do uh, think about what you're interested in exploring, how you write things up. That's important. That's important skills. But they're skills we can help you with. Um, no one's going to make you do a study proposal uh, exactly as you wrote it later on. And the personal statement, again, is it's a really nice opportunity to write some of these things down. But I think the video is 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 a really important part of the process. You do have to give as part of your process, um, as your a part of your application, you do have to do a two minute video and you have to answer these three questions. When I open up applications, I look at the video first. I look at what you, where you are, what you're doing who you are, I like listening to what you're saying, and I like to look through your portfolio while you're talking to me. Um, and I have often made a decision within those two minutes about whether I want to have a conversation with you or not. So for me, that's the hook. Incredible. Um, thank you very, very, very much, uh, Paul, for your time. Uh, and your expertise and all of that, uh, incredibly helpful. If anyone has any questions that weren't, uh, they didn't get covered, please feel free to follow any of those questions, um, follow any of those email addresses that were popped up and also to email opendays at lcc.ac.uk. Um, and uh, otherwise, thank you very much for attending and I'll end the, end the webinar there. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye, take care. Bye-bye.